Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, and thank you, everyone who was um, in last week's class. That was that was an amazing experience for me. You know, when I um, came into the, you know, in our first class, I feel like this in some way has been a much larger experience than just a few weeks. But in our first class, I was saying I had no idea what would happen with trying to read text from Kabbalat Shabbat this way. And um, I was so impressed that by the end of last class, we were wrestling as a group with some really complicated shifts and transitions and we were attending to them and not papering them over. And um, people were contributing fabulous um, possibilities, but possibilities that kept opening other possibilities. I was just delighted, it's a peak experience. So thank you. And I will never read that uh, psalm again the same way. So um, uh, at the end of that class, um, when I was uh, pitching my plan for this class, several people enthusiastically said, we have to do L'cha Dodi. You know, they uh, have already learned from uh, experience that you can't count on me to get to more than one text in, um, in one class. So, um, so I decided, yeah, we're gonna start with L'cha Dodi. If we can also talk about Psalm 92, that will be wonderful. Um, but I wanted to, you're very welcome. I wanted to begin that dis um, discussion by asking if anyone was among those who uh, was um, lobbying for us to talk about Lacha Dodi. Why? Why? Why were? What is it about that text that is exciting to talk about? Um, Yeah, Adria. So what I said specifically, I didn't feel like I was lobbying, but what I said specifically was that in another session, people were asked what we loved about Shabbat and Lakad Odi came up a lot. Now, whether mm -hmm. it's analytically the, the text that's most useful to delve into in English. I don't know. I don't know a lot of this stuff. You know, I'm very, uh, very. It's very new to me. So, so I'm going. That, but that was it. And plus, everyone gets enchanted. I, you know, I like being enchanted. It's one of my favorite things. Uh, states of being. And it is an enchanting text. It's um, it just as poetry. Um, in terms of the way sound and meaning come together, it's probably the high point of Kabbalat Shabbat. It's an amazing poem um, on a lot of, you know, just from a purely literary perspective, what's being done with sound in the Hebrew. Um, and also it's a blast to sing at services. I've never not had a good time singing that. So that is definitely possible. Um, I don't, does anybody, when, when we get to Lachado D, is anybody processing it in terms of content as opposed to just shouting their heads off the way I do? Yeah, Florence. Yeah, I had sung, uh, you know, Lachado D for years without paying such too much attention. And then at a really tough time in my life, the, the third stanza where it's, if it's actually, I disregarded totally what the content of, and it seemed like it was saying to me specifically, come, Get up from the place of darkness. You've been there too long in the place of crying. And 
that and then there was this the who I don't know about the who part. I don't know about the part, but the but the fact that there might be this embracing compassion that's already present that I wasn't accessing to that still that stanza gets me pretty much every week but it did lift me in a way in that really tough time that I still just feel like it's got some real power there thank you that's a beautiful into it and one of the things that is a in between the Chadodi and Psalm 92 is that feels to me counterintuitive in terms of entering into the Shabbat spirit is they raise really painful and scary aspects of human existence and you know you know history and suffering it's not let's have Shabbos because everything is wonderful anyway, you know, and so we can easily relax. They remind us that the world is, that there is destruction and trouble and um, things to be afraid of and things to recover from. And we're gonna have Shabbat anyway, like somehow remembering that is part of it. And it's always puzzled me. And Florence, what you just said really opens that up for me to see how those two things could go together. Lois? Hi. Um, I don't want to be a wet blanket, but I fear I will either be a wet blanket or sound heretical in this context. So let me start by saying, uh, Florence, what you said, I, I also like to fasten on single lines and sometimes like one line or one verse will just jump out at me, like it jumps off the page and it says something in the way that that line did to you. So I'm not gain saying that at all because that happens um but until i have to say this i hated Lechadodi. until <laughs> sanya knows this until i started singing it with bj so i i love singing it i love the music i go along with it you know it's a thrilling ride okay even here from western massachusetts joy however <laughs> I don't like the whole myth of it at all. And I teach it in a course on Jewish philosophy and Kabbalah. And I'm sorry, it just doesn't speak to me, this idea of a holy marriage and that we're the wedding guests and we're ushering in the bride. Like I have to say, to those people who find it meaningful, good, enjoy it. It leaves me cold. And I never enjoyed singing it until I sit. I, I like the BJ melodies and the spirit. But so the content, I kind of leave at the door, except occasionally a line rises up that's so beautiful, you know, but on its own, not as part, as the, not as part of the whole story. Thank Sorry you. if that was a damper, but you asked the question. No. no, no. I mean, one of the things that I want to do, like I say, I don't, when I'm singing La Chadodi, I'm not thinking about what it means. Like a line will jump out at me now and then here and there, but I'm not focusing on the content of it. And that's what I want us to do tonight. And it, that's not because it all has to be great for everybody. Um, it's just that it's hard to do in the context of Kabbalat Shabbat to really pay attention to texts as they unfold. And that's what we want to do here. So, but I wanted to start by hearing what people's experiences are. And, and I love the variety of experiences, so thank you, Liz. Sonia? Whoops, you are muted. I'm sorry, thank you. Um, uh, I also was very moved, Florence, by what you said, and um, and I was also, um, in, a, in a sense, reassured, uh, Lois, by what you said, and and, I'll share my my own um, pretty strong reaction to the Chadodi, and it's more along the lines. Although those very lines, that very stanza that Florence um, pointed out, is um, and has struck me as very beautiful. But I don't know Hebrew, so I know the Chadodi only from reading the translation, as we're clipping along 
with the singing. And um, my my general response is that um, it, it's the it, the heteronormativity of it and and the notion of the Shabbat bride um, don't I, I don't really relate to comfortably. It's not it's not you know it it, it doesn't resonate with me. So I'm a little put off by that. the The music itself kind of puts me off. Sometimes, um, sometimes I enjoy singing it. I like when it shifts. We we shift at BJ to a more upbeat uh, tune, and and that's the point at which the congregation sometimes, like a, a lot of people, get up and and dance around in a great big celebratory circle, um, which I used to do as well. Sometimes, sometimes I'm not in the mood and. I'm not feeling as well as I used to when I was younger. Um, and even the singing is a little hard for me. But but there are two other aspects to it that are a very personal response. The um, the little refrain, I find it kind of sing-songy and almost, it almost sounds, it, it almost is annoying to me, the little refrain. I'm just sometimes not in the mood for it. The other thing is I usher often. And if there's not another person ushering with me, one of my jobs is when we have mourners, at a certain point during Le Chadoti, I have to go downstairs to a room where the where another member of our Chavrat uh, Kadisha is sitting with, with uh, the mourners. Um, I have to time it such that they don't come up too early and um, are ass assaulted by, you know, the dancing and and um, and and they're not late uh, because the door is open and a rabbi comes all the way down the aisle to to greet the mourners and we escort them to their seats at the front of the sanctuary. I know I, I'm speaking a bit, but I'm always nervous about uh, the timing of that. So oh, I'm so sorry. Um, so there's. <laughs> There, there's lots of associations to it. It's not a song that that I, um, you know, that I really enjoy for for all, for all those reasons. But I was looking for it. I really much prefer to 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 talk about Psalm 92. But I said to myself, Joy, you know, this would be a really good thing for me. <laughs> really, <laughs> good. It'd be really helpful. So, so thank you. I'm glad for doing it. Glad to hear from others as well. So, um, Kathy, and then and then we will start sharpening our oyster knives, as Zora Neale Hurston says. Um, I really appreciate uh, the honesty that people are bringing to um, their reactions. I I originally was also put off by the whole bride room thing, um, being, being gay, I, you know, it just doesn't do it for me. Um, and, um, but, you know, I like the gaiety of the scene. I, I you know, I, I can't really, um, I can't get past that. that that's, that is uplifting and fun. Um, but I was reading the translation a little while ago, and it said something about um, Shabbat spoke to the Holy One asking for a partner. And um, I just thought that <clears throat> to um, to even conceive of Shabbat as a as a being that would speak to the Holy One. Um, that would never occur to me ever. <laughs> that would never occurred to you know to me that uh, to frame it like that um so i i thought that was um, so so unusual um the trashim on um genesis and the creation there's a lot of talking by things that have been created um, aspects of time and space and, you know, the, the angels have their opinions. Everybody's pretty much unanimous in not wanting human beings to be created, you know, like, but it is, it's startling that Shabbat is imagined, is personified 
from the moment of being is imagined as being personified from the moment of being created and from the moment of being created is a person enough to echo Adam's longing, right? Adam's loneliness. Um, you know, where is where in all of this creation is the one for me to, to be with? So the heteronormativity around marriage, believe me, I feel you. Kathy, but I think that there's, that it's also um, a metaphoric framework for, um, for an idea of, of loneliness and overcoming of loneliness and creating of unity out of difference that, you know, it's not a metaphor that works for everyone. Um, fortunately, uh, unlike Lois, I think this poem is a mess thematically. I don't think it manages to successfully carry out any coherent idea or vision, even though I know it grows out of a coherent idea. And even though that refrain keeps coming back, but from like I, for me, I have a queer response even to that. It's like, oh, we've got a, a menage a trois here. You know, come my beloved, let's go welcome the bride. You know, we're gonna have a threesome here. And, you know, um, so I, you know, I know that that's not what's intended, but um, but I do think that one of the things about poetry is that all of the things that make it poetry actually mess up its capacity to communicate unified, coherent meaning. You know, in Hebrew, for example, there's this incredible sound effects. My God, I wish I could do what this does in English. You know, with the repetition of vowel sounds and some consonant sounds and um, end sounds that sort of function as quasi word refrains, even though the words aren't being repeated. It's just, it's extraordinary, but it is distracting as heck. You know, if you are paying attention to the sound effects and what poet wouldn't want you to pay attention to the sound effects, it is awfully hard to pay attention to coherent argument. At the opposite end of the spectrum, you know, when I was teaching comp, I wanted kids to strip out all of the flowery stuff. Like, I wanna pay attention to what your ideas are and how they relate to one another. I don't wanna pay attention to your language. So poetry that is very poetic, as this is, is very lyric, um, makes it hard to carry through a singular driving vision or argument. So there's pieces of a lot of different um, perspectives in here. And I'm hoping that by looking at the, you know, basically it's a series of ecstatic declarations and orders. And I think that by looking at, again, at the speaker and who they're speaking to and what relationship is implied there and where we locate ourselves, I think we're going to see that we're, we're kind of moving around the cosmos quite a bit. Adina? I'm sorry, you are muted. Got it. Um, I, just looking at it carefully, I, I realized that a lot of the, um, the commands are mostly um, uh, speaking to an individual, but the second one is um, uh, uh, a command to, uh, in the plural, uh, saying, let us um, go out and greet the Shabbat. Um, I don't know, it sort of struck me that it's speaking to the whole community. Let's do this as a community to go out <clears throat> and greet Shabbat. And then it really acknowledges the, um, how uh, uh, essentially important Shabbat is to us. You know, it's called here in English, the sacred wellspring of blessing. Um, and I, uh, I just haven't paid <laughs> um, attention in the way I'm paying attention now. And, uh, and then the origin of Shabbat and how long, how far back it goes. But um, I sort of like this call to the, uh, addressing the community mm -hmm. and acknowledging the, how far back it goes and how, cent how central it is to our blessings um, as Jews. 
Thank you, Adina. Yes. I, I, can I just point out one other thing? I don't know if this had been mentioned at some point, but that the that the first letter um, of each verse. Uh, wait, hold on. Am I uh, one? Wait, maybe I left something out. No, it's an acrostic for the author's name. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, you're totally right about that. And again, that's another thing where if you're paying attention to that, you are not paying attention to what the words are saying. Like, you know, the, so it's pulling our attention in a lot of different directions. Joyce? Yeah, so what I was going to say was that um, some years back, I went to CBST when a friend of mine was a cantorial intern there. And that seventh stanza where it says, um, it's the, the, the words are Yasis Alayach Elohayach Kimsos Chatan Al Kala. They change it to Kimsos Lev Al Ahava. So that's um, a love, love for um, his, I guess, lover um, as a way. And that, that's really in response to, um, I think, Kathy, you said something about that. So that it, so that it changes from not just uh, you know the the typical bridegroom, but it can be you know or or I've also heard chatan al chatan. Yes, and I oh. you know I think that those are all things that are maintaining the the same basic metaphor. You know I don't think that those are violating the um, the bones of the 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 system of meanings that the poem sets up. Um, but I wanted to pick up on what Adina was saying and see if we could make a quick tour of looking at who is being addressed in each of the stanzas. So I'm wondering, come my, so Lecha Dodi, come my beloved. How many people feel like they're the beloved? Like they're being addressed by somebody that they didn't know was into them, or you know, this is, or are we overhearing something? Um, you know, like this is a wedding party, and we're overhearing one person talk to another, saying, "Oh, come on, let's go, let's go greet the bride and and bring her in." So, Adina. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure I understood the question. Oh, no, no, that's okay. You had unmuted suddenly. So I thought you Oh, were... no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No. Oh, that's okay. It was, it was almost like a game show. It was like, bing, you know, as soon as I asked. So, um, I personally don't feel addressed by come my beloved. Uh, Adria? So I want to, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm old. I, I've been like a lesbian since the 60s. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I hated I hated heteronormativity, which I, before I knew that word, because um, it didn't exist then. But, you know, when I sing it, come my beloved, and because I know, and I don't know as much as you all. So like, oh, I know Dodi Lee. I just, it's, I feel all welcomed in, and I know that's not what the words are, but, it, and Sonia, I haven't chanted this as long as you have, only on Zoom, and only with BJ do I love it. So, you know, if you're only doing it for a year or two, you don't even get to get bored. I'm not even <laughs> near that yet. <laughs> you know, I would like to say, actually, I came back, if you don't mind, Joy, uh, to BJ about five and a half years ago, um, after a long absence. And um, when I came back, I started going to services Friday night and Saturday morning. And La Cato Di was beautiful to me at, at, at first. You know, um, I've gone through um, phases. We go through, you know, different moods any given day. And some days I'm so happy when everyone dances around. I just really, it lifts, it opens my heart, it lifts me, 
Um, I didn't mention, I think there's something about the poetry that that is um, is over overdone for me. It's it's over, I don't know if it's romantic or just too dramatic for me, but you, you know, the, the imagery, but but I've really enjoyed it. And, and you know, and I hope you can continue to really enjoy it. And I, I think I'm gonna enjoy it more after this, that, this session. So thank you. So we're starting out with, I, you know, I don't know, somebody's having a wedding. I don't think that the Come My Beloved is that neither, I don't think either of these people are supposed to be marrying the bride necessarily, unless it is a menage a trois kind of thing there. So there's this other kind of relationship going on. But then in the next verse, we move into, the, as is common for medieval Hebrew poetry, um, there's a lot of weaving of bits of the tra of tradition, you know, midrashic tradition, bits of Torah. There are many um, echoes all the way through here. So, but we jump from this wedding scene, you know, come my beloved, to something that seems, and now for something completely different, as Monty Python would say, you know, there the midrash that uh, attempts to harmonize the fact that the when the Ten Commandments, you know, there's one that uh, relates to Shabbat. One of them says, remember Shabbat. And the other says, watch or keep Shabbat. And it's harmonized by saying, yes, well, you know, this is God talking. So God managed to say both at the same time. So we jump from the midst of this wedding thing. And this is why I don't feel like the heteronormative mystical frame is that strong because it has nothing to do with this. Um, we're just completely leaping out into, and you know, to a realm, I think actually inviting us to consider this mystical place, right? Suddenly we are back at Sinai listening to God say two things in one word or two words in, in one word or two, versions of a commandment uttered simultaneously in some way. And the, it's connected to God's oneness, right? So God's name, like there are these two things, but they're actually, you know, one. And that was a miracle that was done by the one. And God's name is one, God is one. And Right, so there's this just burst of oneness, which I think has nothing to do with the wedding frame at all. Um, and I have to say that my, you know, speaker and addressee thing really doesn't do very well in this verse either. Um, you know, there's a, a collective first person pronoun, but in the refrain, l'cha dodi, it does feel like whoever is speaking is located in time and space. Something is happening. They're with people. There's relationships that, you know, we're, we've jumped in in the middle, but still it's, and this feels like it is, we're completely pulled out of that, out of any particular social or other situation to a plane where we're reflecting on um, Shabbat's relation to um, God's oneness. And to me, it's out of, I don't, you know, I don't feel like there's anything else in the poem that does this. It is not the way that I would have done it. I think that there are other verses where there would have been a better first verse according to my poetic values. But for some reason, this was what the author felt was the first stop on this journey. Then as um, um, I think, Adina was pointing out in the next verse, it's let us go out to greet Shabbat. So is this the same as the situation of l'cha dodi, come my beloved, let's go greet the bride? Or is this a different speaker, a different addressee? Like, again, I don't see heteronormativity here. I don't see the the Shabbat as bride. Um, we're greeting Shabbat, but Shabbat is not presented as a bride. So like, what are people making of this? Does it feel like it's somebody different talking or? Oops. 
Um, Adria? Oh, I'm sorry, Sonia. Was that a hand? And then Adria? I Sonia. just don't want to be talking that much. I'm sorry. Um, no, no. But, but I'm, I'm thinking that uh, to my ear, it's the same speaker. It's the person who's saying, come, my beloved, to welcome the bride. Let us go out to greet Shabbat. It's this, that's, that's how I hear it. Yeah. Well, so, man. so what do you make of, and by you, I mean anybody, what do you make of the shift from thinking of Shabbat in terms of a bride, which is about as anthropomorphized and personified as you can get to describing Shabbat as well, in this translation, a sacred wellspring of blessing conceived at the beginning of time, finally formed at the end of the six days. Something that wrenches us, you know, brings us completely back to the first chapter of Genesis, God completing the act of creation. And Shabbat is no longer a person or a bride. Shabbat is, you know, this deep, maybe bottomless well of blessing that somehow goes back to the beginning. Um, Adria? Um, at, at BJ, and again, I, I don't know this, I think on verse nine, when I try to follow it at the very end, instead of saying boi kala, kala it means bride, right? Yeah. Don't they change it to Shabbat Hamalka, yes. So what it is? It's Shabbat ha Shabbat Hamalka. Shabbat. Right. The queen. right. Sabbath the Queen. And and as we're talking, I the speaker who said who's talking to their beloved. That's one group of those are some people. I wonder if the bride is God's bride. I, I mean that's because I've wondered about that shift. I mean, which then I take as the midrash on Shabbat, on you know, on whoever this, and so then it shifts it. It's like, and I also feel it as such a collective experience, even though the word is dodi. So I'm I'm more and more not seeing it as a menage a trois, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> like the goddess. I really kind of see it like the goddess is actually <laughs> the bride is the goddess. Thank you, Sam. So, um, you know, I don't uh, ever think of it as a bride uh, in the common ordinary sense of the word bride. I, I think of it as a uh, an attempt at metaphor in the language of many a long time ago that the hope of the Oh, it was to um, to evoke a um, a unification, a consummation um, between the parts of God and, and to God and humankind and all of us in in this great moment of the coming of the Sabbath, which is kind of a pinnacle of what is, perhaps what is possible here on in this layer of the universe. And um, I just don't wonder if we make a mistake to tie ourselves too closely to the word bride and the traditional in the common sense of bride as if you were to look it up in Miriam Miriam Webster's so. thank you I think that the um, your method that you were describing in last class of kind of an all of the above and then you select the things that work is a really good approach to Lafondoti because although the bride thing is the refrain, and you know, one shouldn't ignore a refrain in a good song. The refrain means something different after every verse. And I, I don't think we have time to trace how that changes. But yeah, go ahead. 
may I just follow up quickly? I think in in some ironic way that um, the the hope, the goal, the success of 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 of, of the, maybe of all poetry. I, I have to think about that, but is is an ultimately is an embrace of the, is is a dis, is the, is a, is a dissociative experience from the words that 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 that, the, that you're sent somewhere else to perch somewhere else to be somewhere else to think something else to expand somewhere and um uh and if if and and that we all may have this 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 a unique experience with Odi because we're not focused on the words and and what we're focused on is what does that refrain what the maybe the real power of that refrain is is that we're we all know it and we're all singing it and and in that sense we're all together it is it's it's the unification of of one to the other to each of us um it, it, in the power of refrain but not the refrain as associated directly with the meaning of a word, but the refrain of the human, of, as, it, as it allows us to have uh, the experience of, of being together. Sorry. Yeah. Marjorie? Um, at the risk of sounding like I did last week, I'm gonna say that I think this poem has a little bit of something for everyone. Um, or I'll say that if it's had a little bit of something for me at different points in my life, when I was a young adolescent going to Jewish summer camp and immersing myself, um, it was more of an Orthodox setting and I grew up conservative, but a much more cultural all encompassing environment of Jewish culture. I remember feeling this overwhelming sense of, I don't know, isn't this so cool and amazing when I was sitting in an outdoor amphitheater watching the sunset during the Kabbalat Shabbat. Um, oh boy, um, hold on. Um, service. Um, and at the time, you know, maybe I heard about the, maybe I was reading about the bride and I was, at the time I had crushes on boys. Now I'm in a different space and I'm married to a woman. So I wouldn't read things the same way. But, um, you know, at different points, I remember reading the, the notes in the margin about like, it's in the prayer book that we use today about the, um, how the rabbi who wrote this, um, Shlomo Halevi Alkabaz, was, it says in this book, it says he's a mystical poet, but I, I cheated and I found what I had once known, that he was into the Kabbalah. And so, and so I thought, you know, at other points in my life, I thought that I related to it from a historical point of view, but, um, you know, in all times I relate to the singing of it. I, I usually like all the different tunes that are done. So I don't know. It's, um, it, I, what's possible is that somebody who was a young heterosexual male could find it really cool thinking soon I'm going to find a young bride. It could be, I mean, for many people, it could have many hooks in different ways. Absolutely. I mean, generally when something kicks around for a millennia or so, it's gotta, it's gotta hit, it's gotta be able to hit different people in different ways at different times. But this, I mean, Sam used the word dissociative, which I think maybe as a poet, I would not exactly, I, I think what you mean by that might be close to some things that some poems do, but the one thing that is unquestionable is that poetry works associatively. In, in other words, it often it moves by connecting things that aren't necessarily logically connected. Sometimes they can be, you know, but there's, the things will just be juxtaposed with one another 
And what happens to you as you read the poem, and I think this is what Sam was talking about, and he's right, is that if you follow these associations, if you kind of give yourself over to these associations, you um, come unstuck to some extent from your own way of thinking, right? Because you know, you're reading a poem, it's not going to track your normal way of thinking. And many poems are deliberately written in ways to defamiliarize thinking. And so if you, if you follow it through, you give yourself over to this set of associations that's not yours, and it opens the possibility of um, experiencing something that, that is beyond your normal um, way of experiencing, way of feeling. But you know, there are many di different kinds of poetry, and generalizing about poetry is it's always true of some things and not true of other things. So I don't want to go too far with that, but. In this case, I think that that is the way that this poem appears to work to me is very associatively because we have Shabbat as bride, right? So that's activating what for the people at this time would have been a familiar Kabbalistic framework and it connects to certain kinds of midrashim and teaching about Shabbat. And, um, and then we move to this other realm that connects it to um, the Sinai experience and the oneness of God. And then we're going out to greet a Shabbat who is not anthropomorphized, but who is this wellspring of blessing who connects us to the beginning of time. And then we get to um, the uh, stanza that, um, Florence was talking about being so moved by, where the speaker is now not addressing Shabbat, and I don't think necessarily talking about Shabbat, unless Shrine of Our Sovereign is a way of conceiving Shabbat. But if that's true, that's, again, quite different from the bride thing. So this is quite a chain of associations, all things that are linked to Shabbat. Lois? Yeah, it seems, you know, I've been rereading it as we've been talking, and I, I have a different translation. I have the Koran Sidur, and it seems to me there's almost, there's the opening and the closing, which is what we've been talking about, the Sabbath as the bride, the Sabbath as the queen. And then there's many stanzas. Um, wait, let me count which one this is. Maybe it's the fourth in my translation, Sanctuary, okay, Sanctuary of the King Royal City. The next one, and I think this is key, shake yourself <laughs> off, arise from the dust. Stanza. Put on your clothes of glory, my people. And as I read it, there's several stanzas here in the middle, the filling of the sandwich, as it were, which is really about the people. And then the message is, people, don't despair, arise. And then, you know, wake up all this beautiful imagery. Don't be ashamed. Don't be confounded. Those who... Those who despoiled you shall be despoiled, and all who devoured you shall be far away. And here's where the poem comes, takes the two themes together. Your God will rejoice over you as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. So it's like accompanying the Jewish people through their misery and saying, yeah, it's been lousy, but it can be beautiful. And you are, you, the Jewish people are my, this is God speaking, you are my bride. And I will raise you up just like you're welcoming the bride, the Sabbath, and all those things are then associated and interconnected. I mean, it's pretty dark through the middle, but with hope throughout. But it's that's about right. the people, I think. I, I, think that, I think that that's a beautiful way to look at the, the filling of the sandwich. Definitely not a way I've thought of Lajado D before, but... But I think that that's, that that's the kind of associative movement that's right, that there's this shift. And I think it might be Jerusalem that's being addressed. But I, I don't think this, I think it's really poetic in the sense of it's often not, it's hard to nail down exactly who's being spoken to in these definite authoritative tones. But I think the third stanza is more like toward a destroyed Jerusalem. But then as it moves on, as Lois is saying, 
it, the you becomes sort of broadens. It's like you as the people, right. the suffering people, and that you can merge with the you of the Sabbath. And right, so this you becomes broader and more encompassing of the range, you know, really a you that in some ways stretches from the beginning of time to the current moment, because the, the poet keeps sounding like their words could actually change reality. Like you, you Jerusalem, you might rise up from your destru destruction right now, right? Shabbat is this moment when, like a wedding, I'm a brief uh, footnote about performative language. So there was a, there was a linguist who was uh, interested in words that actually change things you know, language that can change reality. And he realized that there was a category of language, which he called performative language that can change reality. And one example of it is a wedding ceremony. That when you say I do in a wedding ceremony, or for that matter, a, um, a conscription office for the military, I mean, there are a number of different kind of ways that performative language can work. But basically, when you use performative language in the proper setting, you're forever changed by it. And this speaker seems to talk with uh, this optimism, even in the face of destruction, as though their language, you know, shrine of our sovereign royal city, rise up from destruction and fear no more. Like, I've taken care of that problem. You know, all you have to do is get up. All you have to do is do what I'm saying. It's as though these words can really create reality. And maybe that is part of why the Ten Commandments are being invoked at the beginning, because of course, divine language is uh, the model of performative language. You don't get more performative than let there be light and there was light, right? That is ontologically performative. The Ten Commandments, God tones it down a little. It turns out we were still able to lie and steal and everything, even after the Ten Commandments, unfortunately. But, um, but there is a way in which I feel the language of this and the address of the poem is drawing on this um, divinely powerful language as though right now, all of these things can be changed. Just the way a bride going to a wedding can be changed by saying, I do. Florence? Oh, I love everything you just said. And I just, I think I want to just kind of move it a little further in the way that I relate to Le Chadodi. So um, it's, it is this, the, what you, I love, you gave me a word for it, associative language, because what happens for me when I'm reading this is there's this association with what Shabbat might have the potential for bringing in terms of joy, especially, which is great because it's your name. Um, and it, it, there are these different aspects of how joy might come because Shabbat is coming. And the the association between you know this sort of is it jerusalem is it the people of israel or is it me is it me who is had a rough week and here is shabbat that has the potential to bring me joy and that and the back and forth to to me it it you know, I don't, I don't see it as saying to the people. I hear it as, Lawrence, wake up. There's this Shabbat gift that you get that has been before creation, before God spoke, God understood that Shabbat needed to be in the world. And Shabbat is something that then we get the benefit of and so that so that so I I I love the fact that you said associative 
because that's what's happening for me is I do hear this sort of bride groom, but what I try to hear is the union, is the intimacy, is the possibility of drawing closer, even if it's just to myself. So, you know, the part of me that's been distant and alienated. So, so those are the things that I uh, hear in, in this Lefado di um, song, prayer poem. You know, that is beautiful. I, I think it is deeply true to the way that we're intended to receive Shabbat, that one of the things about it is that our human time is coinciding with, in a way, it's the same day over and over again, right? If we say Shabbat was created as the, at the end of creation and that it's singular, right? It's always that one, that same day from God's perspective. You know, from our perspective, it's a different Saturday, you know, Friday, Saturday, every week. But from God's perspective, it's like our human time is coming into conjunction with this day that is indeed built into the structure of creation. And as Florence was pointing out, we come, like we've all been there in the valley of, of tears, you know, or weeping. Um, you know, and coming from destruction, but also coming in ecstasy. We're ready. Sometimes we come and we're ready for the wedding. You know, we're, it's party time. Um, let's make Kiddush. You know, whatever it is, we're coinciding with this day that was created at the beginning. And this poem is inviting us to hold all of those associations, to find ours, but also to hold them all in the sense of trying to receive what Shabbat means in its totality, um, because it's all of these things at once from maybe the tradition's perspective or God's perspective. Judith, you've been waiting a long time. I'm sorry. Um, Everyone spoke so beautifully, Florence and, and yourself, um, that I don't know what I add, except that I, I love it myself. But and to get us out of the work week, you know, and, and depression, whatever we had, troubles, it's, it's beautiful. Um, I go to CBST, and a lot of times Rabbi uh, Feinbaum will get us to sing it and go, no, I don't like, you don't have enough energy. You've got to be more involved in it. And she'll have us all start again and bring in that energy, welcoming Shabbat. And I love the line from, I don't know if it's the right translation because they retranslate everything to the Siegel. But from the very beginning, anointed from the earliest time, the last and acted the first in thought. And we are to be happy. And I saw that was congruent when she said, the woman talked about bringing the mourners up to service. But well, it's lahad dodi, but you're not supposed to mourn on Shabbat. You have to not sit and you have to, you know, I guess adjust to uh, new life without the person. But you can't, you can't be mournful on Shabbat. You have to be joyous and restful and all that. And that's what God says, uh, come, you know, arise from the dust, come closer to me. To my soul, taste liberation. That's what we have here. And that's just beautiful. <laughs> so, yeah. I think that is God speaking. That's why I take it. Taste liberation. I know. And bring my redemption without further delay. Is that kind of, I don't know, the pronouns in this poem are embrace so many different subject positions. It's um, they exist gone wild. Sam? I just didn't want too much time to go by. I didn't want to leave the moment. I, I just, that that idea of yours that that embedded in this poem is this idea of performative language and the power of that is, I mean, I, that's very beautiful and very powerful. And I will never think of this, or, the, or, read, or, or feel this uh, song, a poem the same way again. So I just, 
Thank you for that. I think I want to, I'm delighted with where we've gone. I want to zero in on one stanza that I think raises this issue of who's doing what to whom, who's saying what to whom. It's, um, it's an ecstatic stanza. And I think that, um, you know, the poet is mystical. This comes out of a Kabbalistic tradition, but it's also an ecstatic poem and um, systematic mysticism, like Kabbalah, very complicated um, cosmological systems are in uh, Kabbalah. But there's also a branch of, of Kabbalah that Kabbalat Shabbat comes out of, which is basically experiential mysticism. And which believes that the moment that we're in and eternity can are one and the same, right? And strives for a kind of ecstasy where we can um, experience that together. And I think that this that this poem keeps surging toward a kind of an ecstasy. And I wanted to look at one of the stanzas where this ecstatic motion is most visible. But first I want to hear what Adria is going to say. When, and, and this is more about the performative language and how like things shift. The very last lines, the last two lines, um, now again, I'm reading the the uh, this translation. Come to the faithful, the people you treasure with pride. So, like talking to God, and then come, my bride, come, my bride, or even if it's come, Sabbath Queen. So there is the. It's almost as if. So is God the bride? Is God this? Have we shifted into a feminine? I mean. I, I like this that that this understanding I'm getting of the multi layers or the multi personas, um, so I don't have to try to make it logical. But and then when because when we say it at the end of the ninth stanza, this I feel oh, such a joyfulness just at that line, and there's that merging, and it's almost it's very transformative. It is. That is that. Yes, that is a really beautiful. I'm almost tempted to conclude right there because that you're right. That is the ecstatic moment. Um, all right. Let me see if this. If we wanted to do this, we don't have to, because maybe we've we've hit the high points. But I'd like you to look at the, the middle stanza. It's the exact midpoint of the poem. And so it's on page two of the PDF. It's the second stanza. Or if you're counting, it is stanza five. And it starts, rouse yourself, rouse yourself. Um, it's a beautiful word, heat orary, heat orary. Um, you know, it's like if you read the Hebrew, there's so many rhymes. It's like the whole universe is bells that are ringing and resonating with each other. Like every word is rhyming with every other word. That's this kind of um, mystical unity focused ecstasy translated into the sound of human language. Um, as a poet, I'm I can just look on in awe. But um, so rouse yourself, Hidori, it's it's in the reflexive. Somebody is being told to do something to themselves, right? To um, awaken or um, but but who is you? When we come upon this, who is being told to do this? And and who is doing the telling? Thank you, Lois, uh, for being here. Um, Marie, you're welcome to say, you haven't gotten to say anything yet, so you're welcome to speak to that or anything else that you would like. No, in fact, uh, that's the most important uh, 
part for me. And it came uh, from being at BJ for 21 years. And when I first got there, I noticed that only the congregants sang that part, never the rabbis. And so I asked someone who had been a, a long-term member why, because that was Marshall Myers' favorite part. And uh, he must have, I came after he had, he had died a few years earlier. Um, and and Roly was so connected to Marshall, loved him so much that Roly could not sing when he died. Roly could no longer sing that. And that's why only the congregation sings that. And yeah, and, and it also, I love the idea because you know, I'm a New Yorker, we're all doers, right? It's like, rouse yourself, don't just pray, don't just think about it. You know, like um, Heschel with, I was praying with my feet, you know, he was marching with King. So um, I, I just love that also. And it may have been because only we was, I felt like I was, we were singing it to Roly, like we were, um, yeah, yeah. Um, and the bride part, okay, I, because I'm a woman and um, I, I had been a bride, you know, uh, that I thought that God was calling all of us, but not just women, but men also, but I could see where a man wouldn't have the same reaction, that the brides are beautiful, right? All brides are beautiful. And, you know, my beautiful people come, come to me, be my bride, my beautiful people. Thank you. Such a moving anecdote also. Thank you for um, sharing that. Um, but yeah, the question of who, like, I feel like the heteronormativity of it becomes less problematic when you realize that so many different, including God, I do think in this, the syntax is so um, indeterminate that it can also be an invitation to God to come like the bride or to marry the bride. Like we all get to be the bride. Um, uh, Israel definitely can be the bride here. Shabbat can be the bride. Israel can be marrying Shabbat. Israel can be marrying God. God can be marrying Shabbat. God can be marrying Israel. I mean, a menage a trois is nothing compared to the tangle of erotic consummations that Lakadoti is trying to invite us to participate in. Sam? No, I just wanted to uh, thank Marie and, and, and uh, just a, a small addendum, which was that it... Uh, it, it's not just that it was Marshall's uh, favorite section. You know, the rabbis uh, always take turns leading each of the sections, and it was always the section that he led. So mm -hmm. when there was silence from the bima, uh, for it, there was a, there was Marshall within the silence, and and I think that was poignant for for all of us. Mm -hmm. Still. Well, this is where that anecdote is pointing this up to me, but this is where the performative language, I mean, this speaker says all kinds of things, and I would definitely like to be able to say to a ruined Jerusalem, you know, rise up from your ashes and be rebuilt. And, but if I had to choose just one stanza where my words could have the force of creating reality, I might choose this one because it's instructing people when you rouse yourself, what you're gonna see according to this language is that your lamp is lit, which I think is just so beautiful. I don't even know what it means. Does that mean the lamp within you? Does that mean God's lamp for you? Does that mean the lamp that you are. I have no idea really what that refers to, but just when you rouse yourself, when you awaken, you'll see that your lamp is lit. So you don't, even if you're not a New Yorker and you're not inclined to get out of bed and start doing things, it's worth it because this is what you're going to see. 
Your lamp is lit. Let the flame rise up and glow. Awake, awake, utter songs of praise. Why? Because God's glory is revealed to your gaze. And there's, all you have to do is wake up. If you want to see God's glory, it is right there for you. Because your, your light, the light of you that reveals God's glory, it's already lit. It's just waiting for you to open your eyes and see it. And I would love to be able to say that and have it happen in people. Marjorie? Okay, so one quick thing I was gonna point out if we haven't already is the word hit orary, the reflexive word has in its composition, it has the word or, oh, um, and what is it, an ayin, vav, resh, but then the word or, the reason why it sounds so cool is there's the word or in the next line, which means light, the aleph vav resh. So it's kind of- um, It's a pun. Yeah. It totally is. It is, and it's, and it's but it's, uh, the pun is putting it mildly because it's inviting us to see the, the or, the light in the act of rousing ourselves. Right, it's the light that we would be rousing ourselves to. It's the light that's already in us. Hi, Janet. Um, yeah, thank you, Marjorie. Um, Rabbi. Hi, I just I, I I wanted to jump in here. I just I think that the one of the strengths of Lachadodi is this ambiguity of the and the fluidity of who the speaker is, who who you're addressing because I feel like that's what makes it like alive for me every week. Um, and even in that, even in the stanza that we're talking about right now, like if you look, if you look at the Hebrew, we have heat orri, heat orri. Okay, so that's like rouse yourself, okay. But then ki va orech, um, where it's translated for your lamp is lit. It means because your light is coming. And then we address the light, kumi ori get up my light, um, which I think is like, again, we're like, we're just switching between different speakers. And um, so like, if you're in a position where you need somebody to be encouraging and supporting you and beckoning you that week, like you've got that, right? Somebody's calling out to you. If you are in the position where you need to feel like you're the beloved, you've got that too. And if you're in the position where you just got to do it on your own, you've got that. And it, it's kind of like the end of um, The Wizard of Oz, where it's like, you had the power all along. Like, you could rouse yourself all along because this light is already there for you. You just need to recognize it, open your eyes and recognize it. And so I guess I feel like this poem, like for me, the poem is very encouraging um, and, and very hopeful and um, really kind of like, lights all these different kind of like themes for me that I need on a Friday night. Thank you so much for that, uh, for reading the Hebrew for us that way. That is, that's extraordinary that it goes from somebody telling somebody else to awake to, to us saying to our light to awake and, you know, um, and Shabbat is supposed to be a time when the divine comes to us right? Human time becomes divine time. And so that's that end of the Wizard of Oz kind of thing. You know, we've got the ruby slippers. They were put on our feet as soon as Shabbat started. Um, Sonia, and then Adina. This has been so extraordinarily rich and nurturing and um, illuminating for me. Thank you so much, all of you. I, I, I want to add that my experience of that beautiful stanza that we're, we're just, we're just um, talking about uh, is, you know, I was, I'm always struck that it's up to the congregation at that point, up to the congregation to, to, to sing instead of, in a sense, instead of the rabbis. 
And speaking to your um, comments about the language itself, Joy, at the, the beginning of your introducing this to us, it has this mellifluous quality. I don't know if that's the right word, but it's very, it, it's, it's very soft. So it's not exactly rousing to my ears. And I'm astonished really um, to, to experience as I'm processing all this, a kind of, um, a, a kind of um, disjunction or, or this consonance or something ab about this. I have to, there's a lot to process. It's just kind of like what Rara Jessica was saying, and, and you all have been saying there's so much to process from so many different angles. I mean, the music right there is very, it almost makes me feel a little bit like, it, it almost sounds like my experience has been in the past before this, this session, it, 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 is, it is kind of like a lullaby in a way, the, the, the language, the, lang the language of the Hebrew. And the music is like a, a lullaby. So to say, rouse yourself. So it's a it's a very quiet, beautiful, intense rousing of oneself. You, you know, and and in the context of all the other imagery, it, you know, it's very it's very intense. And then toward the end, there's, you know, there's that that um, as you put it, the the ecstatic, I guess, union. But um, man. <laughs> I'm never going to experience this again the same way that's like, you know, goes for that saying, but thank you all. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm so grateful to everyone. Amen. Adina? Oh, you are muted, Adina. Clearly saying something interesting, but... <laughs> Maybe I should stay muted. <laughs> you may think it's more interesting than it actually is. Um, I'm just, I, I looked at the, um, the commentary here, uh, um, and it says that um, Orech, your light, is the, I don't know if anybody else read this, is the exact middle of the poem that there are 65 words before Orech and there are 65 words after it. And they, um, they interpret it here as God's light. Um, but I'm also thinking about from, from the, uh, the, the point of view of Kabbalah, where they, they refer to God as the light. The divine is the light. And, um, you know, there's, um, I was also looking at something uh, about um, uh, Shlomo HaLevi, and it says that, that the L'chadodi, um, that it was composed according to Kabbalistic, Kabbalistic teachings about the Shekhinah and the Jewish soul. And so I think the emphasis on light and making the, of a, making light the central, the exact middle of the poem has a, a also a Kabbalistic aspect to it. And um, uh, Sonia, you were saying about how soft it is. Well, you know, the hitori, uh, hitori, orech, ori, orech, ori, uri, uri, they're all very sounds, uh, soft sounds. So you have the the ayin bav resh or the aleph bav resh and all those different you know permutations, which is beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Adina. Marjorie. Quick thing um, that uh, usually, in some ways, well, let me just say. I can't remember how any other congregation does it. I'm just going to, which is really silly because I've only been going to BJ for over a little over a year. But um, at BJ, there's a turn in the tune that's used. And I think some B BJ might use like a more Sephardic tune initially, and then they use an Ashkenazic tomb at the end. So to me, what that represents is a coming together of different Jewish world 
friends. Um, and also for me personally, just, you know, I grew up in an Ashkenazi community and now someone close to me is discovering their Sephardic roots. So it's, it's just a very nice thing. And it's a different change of pace as well. Because we get, I, th I can't remember now the different paces, but it seems faster at the end. Thank you. Kathy? Um, I, thank you so much. I, I um, really appreciate everything you've said and the weaving of everyone's comments today. And I think that in a way, you know, we're, we're just this close to uh, touching into the ecstatic in, in our living. Um, I know through meditation and awareness that um, I, I often feel like, wow, I, I was so far away, but now I'm, I'm just so close to touching in to the divine and to, which is, which can be ecstatic, not always ecstatic, but, um, you know, but always, um, but it always lights you up and it always does bring to mind um, this stanza and um, your lamp is lit. And it, it, I kept being reminded about of Pesa uh, while we were speaking because there's so many images and things that um, bring to mind this holiday that, that we're approaching here um, between you know, the, the tears, the, the grief, the sorrow, and the um, <clears throat> the brightness of spring and the celebration of spring and liberation and freedom. So um, wonderful class, wonderful series. Um, you know, I hadn't been thinking about Pesach, but I think it would be possible to have an ecstatic home of welcoming Shabbat. That's all bridal imagery, right? That's really just does that from beginning to end. And it would certainly be possible to have a long ecstatic poem about Shabbat that was all about the good things. I don't know, like I, I try to, um, each Shabbat when the candles are lit, I try to really think about the things that were good in the week. Somebody, I can't even remember who, it was not my mother, but someone um, taught me to, you know, gather the light of the candles in seven times, one for each day of the week. And you know, some weeks, the idea that every day has its own light, that takes more work for me to really grasp than others. But I, but I think of that as the way to receive Shabbat, as I should. I should think about the light of each day of the week that I've received. And now I can bring all of that light with me into this Shabbat with a sense of gratitude and abundance and rest. It's, you know, if you're going to rest, it's good to feel, um, to be aware of all the good things, to feel that things are okay, to, you know, if you're hyper vigilant or surrounded by a, a city that makes, keeps you on your toes all the time, it can be good to think, oh yeah, I'm safe. This, is, this has been good in these different ways. But Pesach, is this prototypical Jewish holiday, which is it is designed to have horror and destruction and suffering is built into it. You can't separate that. There is literally no occasion for Pesach other than it's spring and that's nice, which, you know, that, that's enough, but that's not Pesach. That's just a spring holiday, right? Pesach is, there's been hundreds of years of slavery and massive suffering and it is the moving out of that. So there's this sense that I think this poem does draw on in a very deep way that our holidays are a, not about just achieving a steady ecstatic state, 
but it is about the moving from the valley of weeping or the destruction and moving into another state. It's like, it's not complete without that. Um, and if I was writing this poem, if somebody had commissioned me to write a Lakado D, I don't think it would have occurred to me to include that. I think my own idea of Shabbat and of the spiritual function of moving into holiday time in general is, is just more simplistic than what Judaism's idea of it is. Um, and I'm wondering, I guess, from what many of you have been saying, pointing out, it's reminding me of that weird first stanza. Remember I said, I thought that was like, that was a goof. But now I'm thinking like, well, two words simultaneously mushed into one, you know, multiple meanings all happening at the same time. It almost seems like it's setting us up for what the rest of the poem is gonna keep doing, which is building up these simultaneous associations that gather in all of these different subject positions um, so that everybody can be marrying everybody. And, and that we come as we are with our history of brokenness and destruction. And that doesn't stop us from celebrating the wedding. Um, well, thank you all so much. What incredible contributions. Um, and thank you for the this whole class. It has been it's been a gift to spend this time with you. Really, thank you, Joy. Um, it's been so fantastic to learn uh, with you and from you. And um, I'm feeling incredibly inspired as I imagine other folks in the Zoom room also feel. Um, and so um, we just want to extend a, an enormous amount of gratitude to you. And um, and thank you to all of you for, for showing up and engaging with this complex um, and you know, emotional text um, in such a, um, you know, honest way. Um, so really looking forward to um, uh, to more, hopefully more uh, experiences of being able to learn with you, Joy. Um, and I'm wishing everybody a wonderful Pesach and uh, almost sort of Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> Shabbat Shalom. Would you consider a Kabbalah Shabbat too, since you can only get to about one text each class? Thank you yeah. so much. Or 92, is, Psalm 92. Like, what is that silly driving series that there's, there's endless car That's movies? Right. Anyway, <laughs> yes, you have to do so many to cover all of Kabbalah Shabbat. I would definitely consider a sequel, yes. And, and write that poem. And you are invited to write that, your couple of Shabbat poem. <laughs> Maybe we'll Thank commission you. you. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's extraordinary. Thank you so much, Joy. Thank all and of everybody. you. Thank you. It's Thank you. Have a great night. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.